right, we've got a new segment coming up now with my boy Drama in the house from Young and Reckless. If you guys have ever seen The Fantasy Factory, which literally was my fantasy. I remember when the show first came out, I was freaking out uh, that there was this entrepreneur out there that had built something so crazy. And this nutso young man was part of the cast of that and is now <laughs> built. What's up, brother? It's good to see you. How are you, man? Built his own company from the ground up. There we are, uh, man. I'm so, so honored to be here. Dude, it's awesome to have you here. This is great. I've watched all the shows, so I feel like I'm on like one of my favorite TV shows. You know nice. I mean? Yeah. That's awesome. I literally, and I, I told you this on your podcast, I freaked out when they said that uh, you'd asked me to be on your podcast. Yeah. I was like, wait a second. Drama from Young and Reckless Drama? Yeah, that made me so happy. Yeah. That was, so yeah. The, the cool thing for me, so not only did I watch The Fantasy Factory, but back at Quest when we were... Um, really getting social and we were doing our, cause we did quest apparel briefly. Yep, yep. It's now turned into something much more logical. Yeah. Uh, but at the time we were doing uh, like, like actual apparel apparel. Mm -hmm. And we found your content said, this is an example of staying on brand. Yeah. Which you've always done an amazing job of. Yeah. That means a lot. Cause that's literally like um, probably the one goal of mine that is like the biggest nightmare in my life is why do you trying, say that well just because it's so important to me and i would say that if i'm anything i probably lean most towards a marketing or branding person mm. and i see the power of young and reckless and what we could accomplish if we really hammered home and stayed on brand so like it's literally every marketing opportunity every everything that comes across my plate i just try to like I obsess over whether or not it fits and um, try to make sure that it always does. Why do you think staying on brand is so important? Because I literally think that you either do that or you do nothing. And the way when it comes to building a brand and the way that I explain it a lot to younger people is like building a brand is almost like building a human being. And you want that human being to be trustworthy and reliable and accountable and all those things. And so imagine if you met somebody and they showed up and they were really funny and quirky and whatever. And you're like, I really like that guy. And the next time they showed up, they were completely different. Mm. And the next you you don't trust that person. You don't want to hang out with that person anymore because they're probably a serial killer. right? <laughs> and so not only are you trying to construct this sort of human being type thing, but you want it to be you want people to love it. Mm -hmm. And to want to support it and to like it. And I just think like, I don't know, when, when I named the brand Young and Reckless, I saw the power that it could potentially have. But it's a gift and a curse because the word, the words mean something. Right. So everything you do, people are going to question it automatically whether that is Young and Reckless or not, you know, right. so... How do you think about, um, as you've matured, mm -hmm. how do you think about like staying true to who you actually are? Or do you? Do you think that the brand should in some way represent who you really are? No, to be honest, I don't think the brand should really. I mean, the brand's values come from my basic values, right? Which is um, that young people, I, my goal in life is to encourage young people to sort of break out of the mold. I know you say break out of the matrix, which I love. Right. Um, break out of the mold and do what they want to do, right? And I think that the education system is very flawed, and I think that the way a lot of people are parented is very flawed, and I think that true happiness or success only comes from breaking out of that and doing what you want to do with your own life, right? Mm -hmm. So that is how I look at my own life. That's where I think that I've found a life that I never thought I would be able to have and been able to find true happiness. Um, so at the foundation of it, it comes from me and who I am. Mm. On a surface level, I realize that like my wardrobe is not going to be young and reckless forever. <laughs> uh, I'm not going to be young forever. I'm not going to know who the hot new rappers are forever, who the hot new artists are. I'm just not. And right. I think that where a lot of people go wrong is they hold it too close and they try to keep it with them forever. And it's like, it's not at some point, uh, an 18 year old kid is not going to want to dress like, you know, this 35 year old man. Right. So there, that's where the handoff is for me. Now, as you get into doing content, which I, I think is really interesting that you're now doing the podcast and obviously yep. you and I have talked off camera about finding a way into really giving people usable information. Yep. Um, do you think at all about sort of as this entrepreneur movement happens that you're going to be able to help them? Um, the young and reckless crowd, reckless to find the way that you just defined it, yep. really find their voice and find their ability to um, succeed in business or in whatever they want to do? 
I do. And I'm going to be honest, it wasn't actually like a deep seated passion of mine to be. And I really hesitate, like calling myself any sort of teacher or coach. I'm way more a student. Right. Mm -hmm. But um, it just kind of so happens that some people know who I am. So I have a bit of a built in following. Content is obviously bigger than ever. And the entrepreneur thing is bigger than ever. And so what that means to me is there's way more people listening and there's way more people that have the ability to access what you're saying than ever. So it's almost like the way I see it is everything's kind of aligning to like, you're stupid if you don't do this, right? Mm -hmm. But the way that I look at it is the reason why I do my podcast, for instance, I'm learning from each of those episodes. I'm not teaching. So I'm saying here are people that used to be young and reckless and they're the ones that made it. Now let's listen together to how they made it, right? And when I do like a video blog or something, there's my camera filming right there. It's all I'm simply saying is watch, come with me as I try to figure it out, mm. right? I try not to be too preachy or anything like that. And then with Young and Reckless, my job is to spotlight the people in the trenches going through it. Here's a hot new rapper that's really cool that went through hell to get out of Atlanta and he just signed a deal with Interscope and I'm going to do a spotlight on him. So it's like, here's the next group, mm -hmm. here's the people who made it, and here's me going along for the ride. That's kind of how I look at the whole thing. I love that. And walk us through then as the learner, mm -hmm. how did you pull off what you pulled off? So um, you obviously growing up in Ohio, where you're at today is not exactly the most obvious. No, of I mean, literally endpoints. in this house is probably the polar opposite of Ohio. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying? A Beverly Hills mansion is, uh, is the polar opposite of where I grew up. Same with Tacoma, Washington. There you yeah, go. So. That's the beauty of it. Mm. Um, what was the question? So how did you do it? How'd you pull it off? How'd you oh. end up? You've got this multi-million dollar brand that yeah. you built from scratch. Yeah. I think there are misconceptions about how you built it Yeah. and how seriously you are. I was going to say how seriously you take yourself as an entrepreneur, but you're actually a for real entrepreneur, meaning you run a company. You're not a figurehead. Yeah. You actually run a company. Yeah. So I would say this is, if I could explain kind of how I did it, I guess I would say, cause this is why I try to make sure that I keep doing every single day is I just, I chased opportunity, like viciously chased opportunity. Um, then I learned once I got there and then I didn't hesitate to apply it, mm. right? And I think that I still to this day try to balance those things because if you spend your time learning too much and never acting, you're gonna fail, right? If you spend your time acting, 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 but you're never learning what you're doing, you're gonna fail. If you spend your time chasing opportunity and never doing anything, you're gonna be uh, at best in some famous person's entourage, right? I think that's how those people end up there because you see opportunity, but you never act. My point that's is- That's actually really insightful. That is how, I, I believe. Unless you grew up with that person or whatever, but here's what, a funny thing happens and I can tell you firsthand, when you're around success, the same way you say when you dream too hard, you feel it. Mm. When you're around success, you really feel it. Right. You really feel like you're a comp. I mean, you're waking up in the morning. Maybe you're going to some hot Hollywood party. You're waking up in an amazing house. You're going to an award show. Why do the work? You right. already have all the rewards and you're so close to it. Except for one day, that person stops or stops being your friend or kicks you out. And now you're screwed and your whole life is, has no meaning mm -hmm. because now it's like, wait a minute, what happened? What did I really do? So the point is... Um, give people, so for people that don't know you, how did you end up in, in a very successful entourage? Well, so what happened was I, uh, born and raised in Akron, Ohio, the moment I turned 18, I moved to LA simply because I love skateboarding and LA is the skateboard capital of the world, but I knew I wasn't going to be a professional skateboarder. Um, because funny enough, I had a really bad uh, traumatic brain injury, which I know that we're big on brain stuff right now. Really? Yeah. yeah. I was in a coma From for skate four days. What? Brain bleeding and fractured skull and blood clot in my brain. Yeah. What the fuck happened? Uh, I just, I was leaving a skate park and I went to hop down a set of stairs and I meant to kick my skateboard away, but I landed back on it instead. And I just literally like whiplashed onto my thing and woke, woke up four days later. Whoa, yeah, I had no idea. Yeah, That's so terrifying. so that kind of it wasn't you know I, there wasn't too much long term like craziness from that, but um, it definitely like derailed you know like the passion for because you know after multiple of those you're really screwed. So anyway, right. point is, so I moved to LA um, kind of blindly just following a love for skateboarding. I thought I was probably going to work at a skate shop or something, and uh, my cousin uh, who was a pro skateboarder at the time. Six months after I got here, started filming a pilot for a potential MTV show. 
And to us, that was like, what the hell is, the, you know, what does that even mean, right? MTV was so far beyond any of our like expectations. Mm. And sure enough, I mean, the long story short of it is the show ends up getting picked up. It's a massive success. It's called Robin Big. Um, I was his real life personal assistant at the time. So I get tied into the show as sort of the uh, whipping boy, sort <laughs> of a joke, a butt of all the jokes assistant. Right. And, um, but I will say that, at the time, there was never a piece of my brain that said, I want to be famous or I want to be on TV. Or I just knew, once again, this is opportunity. I don't know what it is, right. but I'll take the jokes because there's a better life at the end of this. Mm -hmm. I'm just not sure what it is yet. So anyway, that happened. That went into a show called Fantasy Factory on MTV. That was the moment where I said, OK, this is my time. Right? I've learned now for a few years. Um, I have my plan together. I know what I want to do. And I'm not going to let this marketing opportunity of being on another TV show pass me by. And that's when I really went full steam on my clothing brand. And, um, and you know, like, for instance, like, I don't have, like, I loved being a part of the famous entourage. But I always looked at it as fuel. It was never the end. Like, it, it, it was cool, but it drove me nuts because I didn't want to work at a in a mansion all day and then drive back to my studio apartment i wanted to come over and visit my friend and then go back to my mansion next right. door and there was never a part of me that was ever, ever tricked that it was mine but what it did do is it showed me that it was possible and i watched it happen and i watched a tv show be made and then become a hit and i watched mm -hmm. brands be made and so that's what i owe so much to and that's what i think has turned into a bit of my life goal right is to say here watch me watch this person watch us you can do that too because i saw what that did for me mm. that changed my life i mean i have family members and friends that were in jail or addicted to drugs or uh, you know blah 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 and I, I truly believe this is a really deep concept but i or a really deep statement but i think a lot of that misery comes from a lack of purpose or belief that you can do it and so you just spiral. Your brain's really powerful. So it's going to be sitting there thinking all day long. And if you don't have anything to think about or goals or anything, you're going to start popping some pills or smoking a bunch of weed to just calm it down. Right. And then, you know, that's where problems come. That is amazing how aware you were in the process. Were, when it was happening, are you thinking this stuff? Like, one day this goes away. One day the show isn't there anymore. I yeah. get kicked out, whatever. 100%. A hundred percent. And I don't, not to even sound like, I just knew reality TV was not a career, right? <laughs> like, yeah, I knew that. And I think we all know that. And, and the cool thing was we never like, our show was never about our real lives. It was never dramatic about mm -hmm. our dating lives or anything like that. We knew it was just a fun thing and we used it to market our products and our businesses and that's about it. But, um, but yeah, I was aware that I needed to hurry up quickly and create a real career because mm. that wasn't one. But it was an incredible opportunity to start one. Right. Um, and I also knew, yeah, that I didn't want to be the entourage. I can't say that necessarily my view was as cl I couldn't probably have said it as clear as I can say it today. Sure. But it just I always felt like it was driving me nuts. Like I always felt like I don't want to be the third guy in line. I don't want to be the you know, the guy that just is the third guy to walk through the door. I want this to be my thing. What do you say when people are like, no, oh, man, that's so ego driven. Like, just be appreciative for what you have drama. Uh, no, I think that that's where the, I think that's where ego, I think that's where ego can be taken wrong. And I think that achieving and creating opportunity and an amazing life for yourself and wanting great things and wanting to give people great things and create great things is not, ego. I think that had I walked around like I was better than I was at the mm -hmm. time, that would have been ego. I acted like I was third in line. Like if you watch <laughs> Robin Big, there was no ego in me. Like I was like, sure, I, this is what I'm going to do. This is, uh, this is funny. This is, I'm going to go through this and one day I'll be able to be in a position where I can be in charge of something. You know? I have to say, as a religious watcher of the show, mm -hmm. I, I, I'm not sorry, not Robin Big. I've actually not seen that. But oh man, um, you'd get a kick. Now that we know each other, pretty funny. You'd see me on that and be like, "Holy <laughs> cow!" <laughs> but watching Fantasy Factory, yeah, and seeing like your endless good humor about yeah. everything, yeah, and then what I found so interesting is 
what you did after that and then really building a business. And because there was so much parallel, it was like you were blowing up young and reckless as I was trying and failing, by the way, to blow up Quest Apparel. Yeah. And so seeing that in there, like you were really becoming an entrepreneur that was able to execute, yep. which is such, like there's no evidence of that in anyone until they do it, right? You can never know that no. somebody's gonna be a successful entrepreneur until no. they do it. So it's pretty incredible that you were able to make so much out of that And I'll say this, I don't like, you know, um, I questioned it, you know, like, there, like this is how it works, right? When you're, sorry to, spoiler alert or, or whatever, <laughs> if anyone was a, a, a super diehard fan, but like, there was an episode for my 21st birthday where they shaved the center of my uh, head because they said um, that I was balding and this is what I was going to look like when I was older, right? right? So they shaved me like I was a bald old man. Uh, I wore a suit. We got on a party bus. We went to Las Vegas and we partied all night for my 21st birthday with me looking like a crazy old man. Right. They came to me first and said, hey, we have this idea. We want to shave your head. We want to blah, blah, blah. Right. The problem is you look at it and you're like, that's hilarious, right? You know, like that's absolutely we can do that. I'm not, who am I to say, no, I take myself too serious. Right. That's too far. There, I don't think there was hardly any ideas that I ever said were too far. I realized that was my role on the show and I realized it was hilarious. So like, who am I not to do it? And then, you know, you film it and you act like, oh my God, you're shaving my head. This is so crazy. <laughs> I, and now I will say I did 100% worry that it would limit me from being able to ever be taken seriously. Mm. Um, Why do you think it hasn't? I don't know that it hasn't. I still think it might. Um, I still think that even though, here's the conundrum, even though I wouldn't have had the opportunity to start the business, had I started the business without that history, maybe people would be like, oh my gosh, he is the greatest 30-year-old entrepreneur, this guy is a genius. We're now they're like, oh, that's drama from the thing. <laughs> I don't know, but it's all, all right. to me, it's just, how you, it's just how you use it. To me, it makes people relate to me much more. It makes people feel like, damn, like I watched him go from this little assistant getting picked on to like he's doing well now. Right. And I think that that adds a lot more depth to who I am. So I, it was my only way in. It was my, so I can't question it or I can't even really spend too much time on it. I think it was my only way in. I think that I played it how I wanted to play it. And I think that... Um, it's led to an insane story and something for us to be able to talk about on camera, you know? This, to me, this is one of the most important principles of entrepreneurship is waiting for the perfect opportunity yeah. is a death sentence. And oh, taking yeah. the opportunity that you're presented and then figuring out later how you're gonna make the most of it, I think is super smart. So there are countless times where at Quest, at Impact Theory, an opportunity comes up and I'll tell the team, look, this is not the perfect opportunity, yep. but it's an opportunity. Yeah. And so we're gonna take it, we're gonna get momentum. And this is where that whole concept, we have the shirt called Momentum Matters. Yep. And it's like getting people to understand fucking momentum yep. is everything. Yeah. And if you can't build momentum with something, with whatever opportunity, yeah. then you just... I agree a trillion percent. I would say in my own case, like Young and Reckless as a whole was a bit of a piece of momentum, right? Like, I mean, I've always 100%. been interested in clothing and I always wanted to make my own business and blah, blah, blah. But like, did I grow up in, in Akron, Ohio, making sketches of streetwear? Right. Cause my, no, I saw the opportunity. I saw that these things were converging and I could use the show to market this product and it was a good product to do. And then you could, you could send it to Pacific Sunwear and everything right. lined up for that one. Keep in mind, I also tried music production. I tried microwave burritos. I've tried a little bit Dramas of everything. microwave burritos? Yeah, they're called loudmouth burritos. Nice. And it was like pizza flavored. And so I've tried other stuff. This one just worked. Right. But um, my point was, so I followed the momentum. I followed the instincts. I created the brand. It worked. It lined up. And then there was a moment when Young and Reckless became really successful and the show was ending um, where I started taking it too serious. And I started saying no to good opportunities because I wanted to protect the brand so closely. And I think that was a big moment for me of learning like, whoa, 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 don't get too serious here. Mm -hmm. And still don't forget to follow that flow, you know, cause it's not always gonna go how you want. It's not gonna be perfect. You are you just have to protect it within the boundaries of the, protect the brand within the stream of opportunity and keep pushing, well said. it would be my opinion. All right, we have a fan question. This one comes from Cage Hits. 
Question on personal branding. The new thing is to be the face of the company and stepping out front, much like Tom is doing here at IT. However, what amps me up is being like Batman in a sense, where you take on this huge role, but you do it all from the shadows. So in business terms, it would be like building a huge business like a quest, but being able to leading, but being able to lead it like Batman, if that makes sense. Would love both of your opinions. My opinion is that sounds really cool, and I would love to do that too. But I don't believe that it works as well. I don't believe there's a plan on how to do it. I believe that you're relinquishing a lot of control up to just the universe. Um, and I'm just a firm believer. Sure, I'd love to live in some weird mystery $100 million mansion and pull the strings from my MacBook. Right. <laughs> um, but um, it's not, there's no plan of action there. There's a plan of action to get out front, talk about what the brand is, talk about what you care about. And I don't know, that's why I, I like the idea of it, but I can't see a way to do it. I'd rather attack and be up front. Yeah. So first I'll say that Bat Batman's company is called Wayne Enterprises. <laughs> so uh, let's start with that. True. Um, and I think that in any other time in history, I would have been in the background. Mm -hmm. um, and any other time in history, I think that I wouldn't be able to succeed to the level that I have mm -hmm. because my innate personality, the things that I love, and, and by innate, I mean that I've spent since the time that I was a kid fanning these flames of, you know, focusing on my compassion and team building and all those things, which I did get early resonance with. And so that's what I love doing, building community, being inclusive. Like mm -hmm. those are all things that I like and pre social media couldn't be rewarded for that. Mm -hmm. um, taking care of the customer never used to be the most empowering marketing vehicle you could possibly ask for. It was always good, yeah. but it was always a long play, right? It would take 10 years for your reputation to get out there and in yeah. a startup world, that's, that's a, a huge financial investment to make to hope to reap the rewards in 10 years, which is why so few companies did that in the past yep. and why so many companies are doing it now because social media allows you to, when you're good to somebody, unintentionally, they will spread the word or when you're bad to somebody, they will unintentionally spread the word. Yeah. So, um, we're living through an era where I think as an entrepreneur, if you're not looking at the tools that are available to you and taking advantage of those, you're just being a fool. Yeah. So if you don't have that skill set, then don't do it. And if you don't want to build that skill set, don't do that. But I would say you need somebody in the company that can, because this is how people engage with brands and content. Yeah. Also, forget about millennials for a second. Start looking at Gen Z. Gen Z is going to demand that you tell them who you are. You're going to need a live camera on your face at all times. Essentially, time. right? Yeah. And if for no other reason than they, they really want to know, yep. like, are you supporting people? Are you helpful? Are you inclusive? Yeah. Are you empowering people? Like, it's what they care about. Yeah. So if you understand that that's your consumer, that's what they care about, and you need to build a company that is going to give them something that they feel is valuable, not that you think is valuable, that they think is valuable, yeah. you're going to have to do that. So um, like you... I would have much rather been in the background mm -hmm. and for at least two years before I started stepping out front at Quest, my marketing department was heckling me yep. to do it. And they're like, dude, you've got to step out. They wanted to do a reality show. Like we were growing so fast. They're like, this is so unprecedented. We could get somebody to cover this. I was like, absolutely not. No yeah. way. I have no interest in stepping out front. And it wasn't until it was just getting so obvious yeah. that it was the most part powerful marketing vehicle and that things were moving away from the traditional way people thought of social media to now personal branding yeah. that I think in a it. few years it won't even be looked at as a strategy it's a necessity like I don't it's like saying I wish I could have a really really big company but just not have to worry about a silly little customer service department right. you know it's like I know yeah. that that would be cool but I just don't think and I, and I don't know anyone personally who has chosen the strategy of being mysterious and it's paid off in any way I think mm -hmm. that it just appears that way in some companies, but it's not. Yeah, I'm that's my you. opinion. All right, so we've got a giveaway. We're going to be giving away a young and reckless way. Oh, yeah, and for bag. as much fun as you guys made of me, uh, let's get this bad boy over here. We have a bag. Nice. So is it the bag and everything yeah, in it? Heck yeah. Nice. So we've got dope hat, got some shirts, got the backpack. Nice. Hoodie. Look at that. Ooh, went all the way to a hoodie. All right, and the question here is, what episode number of the Short Story Long Podcast 
was Tom on? Like what that. number of the short story long podcast, which is Drama's podcast, was I on? All right, drop that in, and you can win all this amazing young and reckless swag. Which That's we'll good. Put in our little gift, we'll gifty spot here. All right, and I think we had another question. Yeah. This is fun. Here we go. This is from Tina Kohlberg, Drama. Before the accident coma, did you always think this way, real with yourself? Perspective about ego. It's really funny. That's a funny question because that's something that my cousin Rob makes fun of me for a lot is like, he's like, man, you, you were kind of dopey before you had that head injury and you just woke <laughs> up an entrepreneur. Right? Really? But, but it's a joke. I don't, I think, um, obviously I think about it a lot and I'm reading. How old were you? Uh, 18. Whoa. And I'm reading Phantoms in the Brain right now, mm. the Ramachandran book. And did I say that right? Yeah. And there's all this stuff about brain injuries and all the effects that it can have. And I'm just sitting there thinking to myself, like, was I the same? Did I really think this way? The honest answer is yes. Um, I think to be honest, I personally don't think anything is different. Nobody that I know has honestly said anything is different. The only thing that it did was for years, it gave me really bad anxiety because what happened was I had a blood clot in my brain and I couldn't leave. So that happened in July. I was trying to move to California. I had to keep going back and getting CAT scans over and over and over every month to see if the blood clot had went away. Mm. And finally, by November, they said, look, it still hasn't went away, but we're not going to keep you here. You can move if you want. So I'm like, all right, I'm out of here. But they said, like, there's a very, very, very serious chance that you could have seizures, that you could have, you know, repeating issues. So I literally, when I first moved to L.A., I was a little anxious anyway. But anytime I would feel like even slightly lightheaded, I'd be like, here it comes. I'm having a stroke and a seizure all at the same time. You know, like I'd be like, it's over. So it gave me this sort of lingering weird anxiety of like something terrible is going to happen to you at any moment right. that I, I, I had to get over. But. That was it. It didn't turn me into Superman, unfortunately. That is a little unfortunate. Yeah. But that's like really scary. Yeah. Like that's a for real brain injury. Something that knocks you out for five minutes is terrifying. Yeah, it Something was Something knocks bad. you out for four days. It was bleeding brain back here and then I had a concussion in the back and then in the front from it bouncing back forward. And then the, uh, the blood clot was from the skull fracture. Um, it was weird. The weirdest thing is you wake up four days later and like your fingernails are longer and your facial hairs and it just feels, you know, because you're like, what is going on? Wow. Like these things happen that you don't think about. What was that moment like? I mean, that's like out of the fucking movies. I'm going to be honest. As best as I can remember, it was sort of this like, like you knew something happened. It wasn't like, where am I? Get me out of right. here. And it also wasn't like, I heard you talking the whole time. <laughs> it was just sort of like you knew that something happened, but you didn't know what or or where. Because I don't remember. All I remember is eating breakfast that morning. Whoa. Yeah, yeah. I don't remember the so whole thing. So the day. rest is people telling you about it. Yes. And so I was the filmer for the group, right? I was the camera guy. And so there was, I went home. Oh, there's a couple stories. I went home and I looked at my camera and I'm like, who filmed all this stuff? And they're like, you did. And I didn't oh. remember, and I'm talking, and I'm doing all this stuff, and I don't remember any of it. That would be weird. Crazy. And then um, I also, when I woke up, um, I couldn't taste food at all. I had zero taste. Um, I couldn't read. And I also Whoa. remember I went home, and all I would do is be on my computer because I was editing skate videos. I just love my little computer. And I went on, I remember I clicked on Safari on the browser, and I didn't know how to work it. Like I couldn't figure out how to operate how long a after web the browser. And I was like, oh my gosh, I'm screwed forever. That was, well, so four days, uh, we'll say in a coma, maybe two days in the hospital. And then I got home the next day. So a week after. Whoa. But I couldn't lay on my left side. I couldn't sleep on my left side because I would feel like I was going to throw up. Like there was just all these weird Whoa. little things. But they just. Is that all gone? I still don't sleep on my left side, but I don't know if it's because of that or not. Really? Yeah. But. Wow. Um, yeah, but I can, uh, everything else, I haven't noticed any longer term uh, side effects. Dude, you got so lucky. Oh, like, I know. Now when I'm reading that book, me, I'm like, right? holy cow, I dodged seven bullets. Oh my God. The brain damage and losing my wife, those are my two fears. Yeah, tell me about it. It's crazy. Yep. All right, we've got another question here from Angela Monette. Uh, Angela Monette Smith, how flexible should you be with the direction of your brand? Or should you define the brand vision and not stray to catch the momentum? Age old question and age old debate. Um, I believe that the answer, and I'm sorry that this isn't more direct, is like you have to know the middle. And like, I don't know, maybe I'd compare it to being in a relationship, right? With your boyfriend and girlfriend. And 
you got to know how far you want to bend to benefit the relationship and for mm -hmm. them. And you got to know when it's time for you to say bye. And only you know that. Nobody else knows that. I've seen it all happen. I've seen people refuse to let go of their brand values to the point where they run it directly into the ground. Right. I've seen people be too loose where it never gets off the ground. You've seen, I mean, you got to look at, I've been using this example a lot lately, but because it's so massive. Look at what's happening right now with Nike and Adidas. And we're talking about Nike, right? arguably the best brand in the world. They did a little project with Kanye West. He got a little squirrely. They let him go. They said, you know what? We don't need you. Who cares? Kanye West goes over to Adidas. Adidas explodes. And Adidas explodes off of influencer marketing, meaning like uh, artists and rappers and all these different people. And based around Kanye West and the Jenners and the Kardashians. Insane, right? Um, Nike, who has had a tradition of never straying from nothing but elite athletes and running. Never. We will never stray. That's why they strayed from right. Kanye West. Their latest campaign is with Travis Scott and Bella Hadid. Because now they're having to say, oh, crap, right. we missed something. And, and Adidas is on to something. And their new collaboration is with Virgil, uh, who's a designer. And they're, you know, like they're now Nike is saying, uh oh, like we yep. got it. So there is no magic answer on that. You have to feel it out for yourself, but feel it. Like do something that feels out of your comfort zone. If it felt bad, don't do it again. Do, you know, hold tight. If it feels like you're not growing, loosen up. Like it's constant, it's an everyday. Thing. There's not one thing that you can write in a mission statement and never stray from. It's not that easy. Yeah, it's interesting. So when I think about mission, um, to me, it comes down to what are you willing to show up and fight for every day, even if you're failing, right? Because the struggle is guaranteed, but the success is not. Yep. So if like building that business is just exciting enough for you that you want to do it no matter what, and you, you know, hey, I got to collect a paycheck and all that, um, I get it. But I went through the hardship of chasing the dollar instead of having a mission and steering by that, mm -hmm. letting that be the filter by which I made decisions. And it was a fucking nightmare. So I've learned the lesson on the opposite side of the coin, which is you can have all the financial success in the world and still absolutely fucking hate your life because yeah. you don't believe in what you're doing. So true. So for me, with impact theory, we have a mission. And I would say if you have a mission, don't ever stray from it. Yeah. Not for any reason, but make sure that your mission is very clear. It's the absolute center of who you are. So if we were to say Young and Reckless is actually about being able to help young people develop what they need to go and be successful, what that, whatever that is, right? To get out of the box. The recklessness is about not letting society put some pressure on you to hold you down. It's really defining your own life on your own terms, bucking what everybody says is safe. Yeah. Okay. Okay. That's, that's a framework even I could get passionate about, right? Like yeah. I could totally connect to that and be like, okay, I'm behind this fucking brand. Let's do this. Yeah. The path to me is irrelevant. Mm -hmm. So the path right now may be streetwear. Yep. But if you realize that there's something more empowering or just because one thing I want you to understand about this young entrepreneur here is he understands the business dynamics of his industry, of his company insanely well. I really fell in love with you at that dinner that we did where you just broke down like the clothing industry. I was like, God damn, <laughs> like from the retail perspective, where it's going, it was really incredible. Thank you. So he, he understands all of that. He knows how to execute. So if you needed to pivot, cause you saw like where the industry is going, this doesn't make any sense to continue to invest in here. Like that's not my mission. My mission isn't about clothes. Clothes was the path to my mission of helping them break out of the box and, and really do something that matters and yeah. get control of their life. So when you have a mission that that's like that, it's people focused, it's broad enough that it doesn't require X, Y, Z business dynamics, yep. then I think you can stay true to the mission. Um, and so that's how I think about it here at yep. impact theory yep. is the studio is a path. The mission is to pull people out of the matrix. So yep. to give them an empowering mindset. So if I realize that the way that we're doing it now doesn't make any sense, then, then I'll switch gears. But I think that if you can switch off of your mission too easily, then it wasn't real to begin with. Yep. Um, so, or maybe it was too small. Like one thing that I would just put out there is like a lot of times people's mission is too small and too close minded of a mission. And so it's too easy to deviate off of. Right. And so everything is a threat to it. And if that keeps happening, maybe it's time to broaden your mission a little bit. A, a quick example, if we have the time sure. is like when I first came up with the concept for young and reckless, the concept for the product was this, um, 
I'm from Ohio. There's no cool clothing options there. It's just you take what you get in the mall. In LA and New York, people line up around the block for cool brands like Supreme and all these mm. cool streetwear brands. I want to create a brand that has that same feeling but is available to the kid in the mall. The problem is over the years, that model, that there's no longer a market for that because most of those brands have started selling to the malls and social media has opened mm. it up and that's just not reality anymore. So now my strategy is I want to be able to make more fashion on trend uh, clothes that are really good, uh, really on trend, really, really cool, but affordable. Right. Because it's always been this mission of I want it to be accessible, right? It's always, whether it's I want to create a cool brand and it's accessible, or I want to create really good, valuable product for a, an accessible price. Mm. But at the top of all of that, the young and reckless brand mission statement has never changed. It's always been to get young people to break out of the box and, and be what they want to be. So it's like, maybe you need to broaden, you know, the mission if you keep getting jammed up too quickly, I, right. I think, because no. things will change, you know? No, for sure. That makes a lot of sense. So where do you see yourself going from here? What's the, what is that plan to help people redefine themselves? I think that like, um, when I look at what I've done, like truly what I've accomplished or like people that I have impacted, I think that I've just scratched the surface. And I think that, um, you know, now that I'm getting way more into this content stuff and the podcast stuff, and I just think that my, the drama universe will be 10 times bigger um, in even a few years than it is or has been this whole time. And I think that it's through, like I said, educating with the podcast and showing my video content and what I'm actually doing and building up the brand, uh, the young and reckless brand. And I just think like, I think that when you, when young people think of me now, they think like, Oh yeah, I think he was on that TV show and he does that young and reckless thing. That's right. pretty cool. But what I would like them to think is like, Oh, that's drama. He, I just watched his vlog uh, last week and he just had Tom on his podcast and he just, you know, he just went on a rant about marketing and the blah, blah, blah. And like, he really, I know him, I have a relationship with him and this is what he's doing and there's charity elements and he's helping people start businesses, whatever it is. Mm. I just think that like, when you think of me, um, I'll be a lot more meaningful to people and a lot more relatable and a lot, it'll be a lot clearer in, in a few years. And I'll just build on that as I go. That's my life goal. Um, is to do that. What role does music play in what you guys are doing? So music, um, we work with a lot of music artists with what we do. The reason why, to be 100% honest with you, is because um, I really personally am drawn to it and I'm really drawn to like the hunger, especially in rap music, especially with a lot of these young rappers. And uh, they just portray the hunger so well. And on top of all of that, it's cool. Because one thing that I always argue too is at the end of the day, I'm not really running a media company yet, or I'm running a clothing company. And I have to work with people that look cool. Right. So you have to be, you know, people have to want to dress like the guy in my photo shoot, right? It can't right. be a guy sitting at a laptop, unfortunately, with our new t-shirt <laughs> on. Nobody's going to buy it. So it's kind of like, how do you, where my real sweet spot is right now is young, hungry, passionate people that look really cool. And mm. music artists are a lot of those people. Yeah, music is something that I, and I know we had talked about mm -hmm. possibly even doing some sort of collaboration. Music to me is is a, a driver of community. And so what I mean by that is we're trying to do this thing we call Impact House, mm -hmm. which to create the studio the way that we want, we really need to involve a lot of creative people that are hungry to do something um, really amazing, that are looking for collaborators, that are looking for inspiration, that are looking to be a part of something bigger that's really a cultural movement. Mm -hmm. And so the as powerful as the internet is and as powerful as social media is, I think the real juice is when you connect, like you and I connecting in yeah. real life, right? Yeah. So bringing people together here at the house, doing sort of creative salons. And the vision was always to bring in a musical act, someone up and coming, mm -hmm. create a space where they could perform get people attracted to that. And then you have like the, you know, the breakout session. So you've got yeah. the musician celebrating the hunger, the whatever, and then you've got that breakout of, and now let's really create something. Yeah. Yeah. It's just cool. It's a cool, um, it's just cool. The same way it's cool to have at a party or cool to have at an event. It's cool to have in your clothes and it's a cool story to tell. And I think that it's a really easy 
And I just love it. Like I said, I used to want to be a music producer, you know, and I just... Right. You were DJing for a while, weren't you? So the first thing was I was actually producing music. I was making beats and sending them out every day. And I was calling myself Drama Beats. And I was... Uh, <laughs> and I really thought I was the next Scott Storch, right? Um, and then I just kind of tried DJing a little bit and whatever. But they just weren't connecting. It wasn't fun the way it was going. I just didn't like it. Um, but I just have such a passion for it. And for creating a song and what goes into that and just the passion of these young artists. And I don't know. It's just something I'm really drawn to. All right. We have another fan question here. Yes. This one is from Carlos Becerra. Drama. You mentioned that you tried several of the businesses in the past. Did you at that time think of bringing value to the people or what was the purpose? So when we were back making uh, burritos. Yeah. What, what were we So thinking? not as much. I will say that I, I do think that as I've gotten older, I've understood the concept of, of sort of bringing value to people more, more than just like a product. Right. You know, I used to kind of look at it as like, yeah, you create a cool business, it's cost effective, you sell it here, which still works for a lot of people. But now I'm much more um, driven by that value concept. So the answer is... What changed in you, by the way? Uh, I just think I matured. You know, I just think that like, when you're young and you're just kind of looking at what people are doing, because I don't think they teach that enough, right? Like, I think that if you go to business school, I've never been, I'm just guessing, they <laughs> teach margins and distribution and uh, maybe the concept of the business and the creative and all this stuff. But they, I don't know that the concept of really adding value to people and asking them mm. to buy product in exchange is taught yet properly. Yeah. So I just think I got older and I realized that that is what really works and that's what people really resonate with and the reason why we had so much success on our tv shows was because we were creating entertainment value for people and they were inspired by the episodes we were doing and the stuff we were doing and in turn they were buying our products and they were subscribing to sort of our lifestyle you know and um i just think i understood that more as i as i got older so the answer what is not really. Like, I wanted to be a music producer. What's the value you're really creating? I wanted people to dance in the club to my stuff. I wanted microwave burritos. I just saw the opportunity that our demographic are a bunch of, like, young college kids who are probably going to 7-Eleven and grabbing some microwave burritos. So I wanted to create a cool brand that was, it was cheeseburger flavored, pizza flavored. It was kind of like this quirky burrito thing. Who taught you to think about demographics and stuff like that? Like, where'd you learn that? Like, I didn't learn that stuff till way later. I don't know. I think it just made sense to me. I think it just made sense. I think that that's why I am where I am. I, that's the part I don't know. That's the part that I think that's in me. And that's what sort of carried me to where I am. Because I started thinking I was going to be a professional skateboarder. Then I thought I was going to work at a skateboard shop. Then I thought I had no idea. But, but there's been this element of me that's just kind of followed instincts, learned, and then viciously applied. How do you go from thinking you're going to work at a skate shop, which is essentially a minimum wage job. I like that. To really dreaming big and becoming so, an entrepreneur. This is why I love that. Uh, that's my whole point. My brain couldn't think more than working at a skate shop. Like I, my dream, I remember sitting on my friend's roof in Akron, Ohio, a week before I left to move to LA. And I said, man, six months from now, I'm going to have my studio apartment. Uh, we're going to be able to drink all the beer we want. <laughs> I'm going to have a full-time gig at this skate shop out in the valley and like we can just skateboard on the weekends and sell skateboards during the week. And it was a dream come true. Right. And it's just that my mind opened up. You know, you just see things. You see what's possible. You see that they're and not the things you were heroes. seeing was was what was going on with Rob? Like Yeah, what with were Rob, but also I had all these other friends that were um you know, you just become friends with... I had one friend who was uh, making music for an up-and-coming rap group and all the stuff that Rob was doing and just all of our circle. There was just so much happening. There's so much happening in L.A. Mm. And you just see, like, well, I don't know. If this guy can do it and this guy can do it, then why can't I do it? And was that the big hurdle for you? You just never thought that that was something a kid from Akron did? Yeah, you just don't. I think that, and I think that that's how a lot, a lot, a lot of young people are is they dream... And they watch a lot of Gary Vee and they do all this stuff, but they, they don't actually believe that they can do it. Mm. And um, I just, wasn't it you on the podcast the other day on Joe Rogan's podcast that said you told a kid he could have whatever he wanted and he said a million dollars? Yeah. It's exactly that. 
It's exactly that. And it's sort of like not only saying you can have more, but look at these people that are having more. Look at us. We're just two normal guys sitting here having a conversation, right? Mm -hmm. Some people look at us like, oh, they have it all figured out. or They had some gifts or they had whatever. And it's just not. That's what I'm trying to break down. Right. You know, and um, so, yeah, I don't know that that's. That's why I love that, because that was my wildest dream. And now the thought of working at Escape Shop, obviously, <laughs> you know, makes me. So what's something in becoming an entrepreneur that surprised you that you want anybody out there considering becoming an entrepreneur to know? Um, just that you can do it and that, like, you just got to pay attention and like I said, be humble and learn and apply it. But nobody's, nobody's that smart. Like nobody's that, you know what I mean? Even me, I go in every week to our office and I'm like, well, I don't know. Let's try this, <laughs> right? Like here's our plan. We got a pretty good inkling that it's the right, you know, we think we know why we're doing this, but mm -hmm. let's go for it. And I've watched people build massive businesses and that stuff. And it's just from collecting information and taking your best shot at it. And I think that people underestimate like I said, their own power and their own ability to, to do stuff. Yeah. You know? No, for sure. Um, all right. So unfortunately we are running out of time. I'm right. getting the, uh, the this rap segment, uh, yeah, I could do this here. all day. If you need someone but to come back at like 3 AM, just give me a call. My man. I, I, I was going to say like, careful, <laughs> careful what you offer <laughs> there here. We go. So right. we need, so everybody drama is going to be back at 3 AM. Make there sure you join us. Uh, um, dude, this was awesome. Thank you so much for coming on and guys check out what he's doing at young and reckless. I'm telling you after being on his podcast, after going, Going out with him to dinner after spending time with him here at the house, like really getting to know who he is as a person. I think what he's doing is incredible. Not only is he executing well, um, but the changing vision of what the company can be and how it can help people, I think is really, really cool. I think this is a brand to watch. An entrepreneur who's now getting out there and um, letting you learn with him in real time is super, super cool. I love it. A very welcome voice in the podcast world. And thank, thank you again you. for having me on, man. It was incredible. Yes. And uh, you thank it. you for being here thank today. Thank you so much. Friend. <laughs> Hopefully we'll we'll see you back here at 3 a.m. And don't forget, guys, do we have a winner on the segment yet? Yeah. We do. Oh, there it is. Okay, so the winner of the amazing Young and Reckless swag is Mike Burkhart. Yay, Mike. And Mike is an active member of the community, so there it is. So super excited, Mike. Well played. And um, you know something that I don't. I don't even know what number. Do you know what number of your podcast I was? 61. 62? 62? 62 for the answer. Yeah, All right, yeah. there it is for the win, Will. Well played. I'm out of here. All right. Well, brother, thank you so, so much.